I guess the uh, what we really want to do here is, is sort of give you an overview of how uh, the RTMA and, and IRMA works, uh, problems we've had with uh, with uh, the RTMA uh, up to now. Uh, we've gotten a lot of your field complaints through, uh, I, I think we've talked to some of you individually, and I know Jeff Craven has uh, has forwarded on forwarded on a lot of feedback. Uh, we know there are very big problems with the RTMA as it exists right now, uh, but we've done a few things to uh, uh, that should improve it uh, quite a bit. Uh, so we're going to show you a few examples of uh, things that have been, if not completely fixed, at least uh, significantly mitigated. Uh, I've put in a few examples of uh, how the new RTMA is uh, is performing, uh, and a few examples of situations where you may still run into problems with it, so hopefully those problems will be a lot less severe than, uh, than what you're used to now. What we're working on for upcoming upgrades, and uh, also tell you about the website and listserv we have set up so that uh, if you have an issue with, uh, with RTMA, you can uh, let us know. Uh, we do want to hear from you if uh, your RTMA is showing something you don't want to show, or uh, or if you have a question, we can uh, uh, we want to uh, be responsive and make this a, a uh, usable product for all of you. Uh, I know there are a few uh, different data streams out there, so in some attempt to uh, to clear this up. Uh, you might have heard about the RTMA versus IRMA. Uh, they're actually the same code. Uh, IRMA is unrestricted by, it's called IRMA because it's unrestricted by time. Uh, it's run six hours after the RTMA. Uh, and the idea here is to pick up late arriving data. This is particularly a problem for mesonet data. A lot, uh, for RTMA, uh, an observation has to be here 30 minutes after the hour. Uh, in order to be used in the RTMA. Uh, unfortunately, 30 minutes past the hour is right when a lot of mesonet data come in. Uh, so we, uh, we ran this uh, IRMA a little bit later to uh, try to capture all of that late uh, arriving data. And these are both uh, operational products. They're both, uh, I believe they're both on AWIS, they're both on Nomad. But uh, there's only a time difference uh, for right now, They're, uh, they are the same uh, under the hood. Uh, I know many of you are probably used to using Match Ops All to do a surface analysis in your local area, uh, so I figured it would be a good idea to tell you what the uh, how the two how RTMA and Match Ops All uh, are alike and how they're different. Uh, Match Ops All will, uh, as many of you know, draw to match the ops. Uh, RTMA won't necessarily do that. Uh, it will uh, match ops fairly closely, but you're not going to get an exact match at every observation, uh, like you might be used to seeing at match ops, although it'll generally be pretty close. Uh, another big difference is uh, I know with match ops all, uh, a lot of offices individually or even individual forecasters within an office can decide which observations to use and which observations not to use. Uh, with RTMA, uh, unfortunately, that's not an option. We've tried coordinating something like that, and we found in practice it, it just didn't work. It ended up causing more problems than it solved. Uh, so most any observation that we, that we get, unless we... Uh, Unless we see a major problem problem with it, it's going to go into uh, the RTMA, and I'll talk a little bit more about that a little later. Uh, also, there are the uh, terrain adjustments that are used in RTMA are a bit different than used in uh, in uh, Match Ops All, uh, and we'll talk about that uh, a little later. Uh, RTMA is a, a data assimilation product, so it figures that we should. Uh, give an overview of how uh, data assimilation works. Uh, combines the short-term forecasts and observations to get the best uh, current state of the atmosphere. Uh, we have observations. 
Uh, each observation is assigned an error, uh, and this helps us determine how much an observation is used. And right now, that's purely a function of uh, observation type. Uh, and I should note for for, uh, for RTMA, we're using uh, pretty much all the surface observations that you have access to. Uh, all the, all the uh, METARs, any buoy OBS, uh, say over the Great Lakes, uh, and basically anything that you can get through MATIS, we're getting. Uh, an important field and the field that's an, an important element, and the element that's probably given us the most problem with RTMA is the background field, or the first guess. Uh, you have to assume that the uh, the first guess is going to closely is going to reasonably closely agree with the observations. Uh, up to now, that hasn't always been the case. Uh, and the reason that hasn't been the case is because we've been using uh, a RAT forecast, a downscale RAT forecast, I should say, uh, as our first guess. Uh, it's the sort of thing that works in theory, but when you're doing a very high-resolution analysis, the RAT doesn't capture a lot of the features that you might that you might expect a, uh, a higher-resolution analysis to capture. Uh, so. Rather, so now, rather than using the uh, the wrap, uh, we're using a blend of a per forecast and a, a four kilometer NAM nest forecast. This is the uh, the smart NAM or the NAM nest that uh, I believe most of you can get through your AWIP system. Uh, we then ingest observations, uh, all the surface observations we can find. We also use satellite winds from NESDIS. Uh, each observation is checked against the uh, fixed lists we have here of observations that we know are bad. Uh, are, there are reasons we put observations on that list and we've cut down on them drastically over with this new uh, implementation. Uh, there's also a gross air check that compares the observations against the background field. And if there's a significant difference, an observation can be thrown out. Uh, this is a problem we've seen a lot with the current RT with the current RTMA. Uh, if the background field does not uh, closely match the observation, the observation will be thrown out, and then you guys will be looking at it at potentially an observation that's say 10, 15 degrees, or even more sometimes in areas where you have uh, complex terrain different from uh, uh, from the analysis. Uh, that's a problem that we uh, solving that we're hopefully solving partially with the uh, with the new background, and we've also done some things to relax the gross air check, uh, which we'll go over in a moment. Uh, this is just a uh, a visual of uh, of how the RTMA works. You can see the uh, the background in the top right, the analysis in the top left. Uh, on the bottom left are the increments. These are the corrections that are made to the background field based on the observation. Uh, how it works basically is there's the difference between the uh, the observation and a background field, the innovation, uh, is then sort of spread out to make an increment. And the way the op and the way this increment is spread out is mostly a function of terrain. So an observation in a valley should not affect the analysis outside of a valley, for example. At this point, I, uh, this is Jacob, I just want to mention a couple things about what's different in terms of how we do data assimilation for the RTMA versus how we do data assimilation for our uh, numerical weather prediction systems like the GFS or the NAM. Um, for the RTMA, we want to, and IRMA, we want to try to match and draw close to the observation. Um, and we want to provide something, especially with IRMA, that can be sort of used as a gridded verification uh, analysis. Um, we're not necessarily looking to do that with the GFS and the NAM. Um, and that's because if you draw too closely to the observations, you'll end up with an analysis which is imbalanced and will provide uh, sort of noise and uh, sort of numerical stability issues for the first uh, few time steps or maybe an hour into the model forecast. So it's important to, I think, I don't know, recognize that uh, the RTMA is doing things a little bit differently um, when, we're, when we're doing data simulation and we're trying to produce, you know, sort of a, a verification data set. We're really looking to try to match the observations um, fairly closely here 
And so, you know, we're, we're really relying on the background field or the high resolution background field in, in our case uh, for, the, for the upcoming RTMA uh, upgrade uh, to provide information in areas where we might have uh, sparse coverage of uh, observations. Uh, so, you know, areas in complex terrain, uh, things like that, you know, where maybe we don't have the best observational coverage, in which case the background will sort of uh, uh, fill things out a little bit and we'll be a little bit more reliant on, on that. So. Um, after that, I'll, I'll give it back to Steve here. Sorry to interrupt. <laughs> no, yeah, no worries. No, no. Uh, so, uh, just to give you a little more details about how uh, about how observations are used, we start with the first guess, uh, and again, we generate an increment based on the difference between the, the first guess at a certain point and the observation at that point. Uh, the increment is spread again mostly as a function of terrain, but if you're over water or if you're over a flat area, uh, an observation's uh, radius of influence, I guess you could call it, um, goes up to about 80 kilometers. Uh, I should, we should also mention that there is a, a terrain escarpment uh, that prevents any observation over the water from influencing the analysis on the land uh, or vice versa. So occasionally we get situations where there's obs right over the coast and uh, because of how the land mask is set up, uh, the analysis will think an observation is over water when it's really over land or vice versa. Uh, hopefully we've solved a lot, more, a lot of those issues with the higher resolution background field and the higher resolution land sea maps that go with them. Uh, another issue uh, that we should point out is when you're in a particularly data dense area, say if you're around a big city where you have METAR observations and a lot of mesonet, uh, if the observations do not uh, closely match each other and there's not a an obvious valid reason why they shouldn't match each other, uh, the RTMA can sort of mix those together and you'll get sort of a, a washout mashed potatoes effect. Uh, I've got one example of that uh, coming up later. Uh, the increments uh, that come from the observations are then added to the are then added to the background field and you get your analysis. Uh, I promise most of the rest of these slides aren't text, <laughs> but we have to uh, just to go through all of this. Um, generally speaking, uh, the RTMA is very reliant on its background field. So if the background field can't pick up a, uh, a certain feature that you're looking for it to, to pick up and you don't have observations, especially if you don't have observations to support a certain feature, RTMA is probably not going to draw, not going to uh, draw the feature. Um, occasionally, we have uh, observations that are that are tossed out by quality control when they shouldn't be, so that should be much less of a problem now. Uh, and in areas where you don't have an observation, you're more or less stuck with whatever the NAM nest and her say. Uh, and again, the uh, the innovation differences over a short distance can sometimes cause a, uh, uh, a mashed potatoes or a washing out of that. Uh, to give you an example of what the uh, what the background field looks like, this is this will be with the uh, with the new background, and we've got uh, the observations are, are uh, plotted on there too. Uh, the uh, the white lines are terrain every 200 meters. And this is over uh, eastern or uh, southern Colorado, I believe. Uh, so you can see that's what the uh, the first guess looks like. Uh, after uh, assimilating the odds, we generate increments. You can see the increments, uh, uh, and I've circled the areas where they're obvious here. You can see how they're more or less centered around an observation and draw and follow the uh, the terrain lines to, uh, uh, to some degree. You see one here and another one. I can get rid of this little... Well, you see a few others down here as well. Uh, notice out here the uh, the increments uh, aren't quite as aren't quite as strong, uh, but you can see multiple ops close together, and they are uh, they can influence each other uh, to a certain extent. Uh, the increments are then added to the background field, and you have uh, your analysis, and you can see how the analysis looks. A little different than the background field. Things are significantly warmer here around uh, 
around this observation, for example. Uh, to, uh, to generate the background field, what we have in operations right now is a one-hour forecast from the RAP. Uh, that RAP, that uh, one-hour forecast is then put through a downscaling process. Uh, grids, the grids are reinterpolated to a two-and-a-half kilometer resolution. Uh, we then uh, adjust using a, high re a higher resolution terrain data set. Uh, and temperature, temperature is adjusted basically as a function of low-level lapse rate. There are some limits in some uh, limits to it, but it's going to be the lapse rate uh, as shown in the, in the coarser wrap. Uh, there's also a, a coastal sharpening that takes place based on a land sea map. There's a roughness adjustment for wind. Uh, and because we're moving from a 13-kilometer uh, forecast field with the wrap to a two-and-a-half kilometer uh, forecast field for, for RTMA, uh, these downscaling effects can have a, a major impact. Uh, so it'll look quite different from a one-hour forecast from the RAP. It's not always necessarily going to look, going to look better. Uh, to go over some of the problems we have, uh, many of our problems stem from the fact that we're using a rather coarse resolution model, particularly over areas of, of terrain like you have in Colorado and Wyoming. Uh, the RAP just doesn't resolve the sort of complex terrain and mesoscale features that you necessarily see out there. Uh, we also have an issue of too many observations being rejected. I mentioned the gross air check uh, earlier. If an observation was more than a, uh, than a certain distance off from the background, uh, the RTMA would assume that the background was right and the observation was wrong. We've done a few things to correct that, and we'll, we'll, I'll go over that in just a moment. Uh, also, we have observations that don't always get here in time for RTMA uh, that you get used in IRMA. Uh, one issue I have noticed from talking with a few of you individually is that those of you who have AWIPS-1 are getting uh, a coarser resolution uh, RTMA. Uh, it used to be a five kilometer product, it's now a two and a half kilometer product. Uh, those of you who have AWIPS-1 are seeing uh, a reinterpolated version of the two and a half kilometer RTMA. Uh, the uh, the land sea mass and the terrain also won't be uh, won't be quite as strong uh, as it would be with the with the two and a half kilometer product. So uh, now that we've talked a little bit about all the problems, this is uh, what we've done to fix them, hopefully, or at least mitigate them. Uh, the improved background field, rather than using the wrap, we're using a blend of the herb and conus nam nest forecast for most fields, uh, though I should mention that for wind and visibility, we are only using the HERB. Uh, we ran some experiments, and uh, some of you were probably involved, involved in this, that we got a better looking uh, wind and visibility analysis with, with just one model. Uh, we've implemented a relaxed gross air check over complex terrain, so fewer observations will be thrown out. We've also implemented a buddy check, so to speak. So when observations match each other but don't necessarily match the background field, it won't be thrown out anymore. So you'll have more observations getting into the RTMA, and hopefully the RTMA drawing to more of those observations. Uh, we've drastically reduced the, uh, the reject list that we have. Uh, what we've found in practice is that oftentimes we put stations on there that uh, uh, that we were once told should not should not be used in the RTMA, uh, and then we'd get a we get an issue asking why it wasn't being used, why an op wasn't being drawn to, and it's because it was on one of these reject lists. So we've gotten rid of a lot of those reject lists. Uh, that was a particularly big problem, not so much over central region but over western region, uh, and I suppose that there was a bit of a spillover into. Uh, uh, those of you who have WFOs in the Rocky Mountains. Uh, also, we have IRMA now, which allows for the use of latent data. And we've added a new variable to RTMA, uh, total sky cover, uh, which we'll go over in just a bit. Uh, this is uh, an example just showing uh, how the buddy check works. Uh, this, is, uh, this happens to be a situation in southern Oregon. Uh, 
And this was, I don't know if you want to talk more about this, Jacob. Yeah, I can talk about this. So uh, this is just a, it's a buddy check right now that we're um, putting into the RTMA. So this will, uh, this, is, this is what's in the parallel RTMA, which I think will go live for NCO, for the 30-day uh, parallel with NCO sometime this week. Um, yeah, this week or next week. Depending on critical weather <coughs> status. Anyway, um, so this is just a fairly straightforward buddy check. Um, it's not super duper elegant, and right now we're only applying it to temperature observations. Although based on user feedback and what and whatnot, you know, we can certainly extend it to uh, additional variables. Um, it works by not by comparing observations to each other, but rather comparing the um, what are known as the uh, innovations or the sort of uh, uh, model forecast minus uh, observation uh, to all of its sort of surrounding neighbors, and basically. Uh, if, 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 if these differences are all similar within a certain radius, uh, then we can kind of consider that, hey, this observation is probably pretty good, and you know, regardless of how different it is from the model background field that's going into the RTMA, we should probably keep it in the analysis. Um, so what's, a, what's shown here on the slides is an application to a, a, a really difficult um, uh, uh, case for the RTMA for a, a, it was a little over a year ago, I believe, in Medford, Oregon. But um, basically, what you see on the left is without the buddy check, and you see a lot of these red circles, which just basically mean that the observations weren't assimilated into the RTMA. Based on feedback we had from uh, users in that region, a lot of these observations, which were red dots, were actually pretty good and should have gotten into the analysis. So after applying the buddy check, uh, we see a lot uh, more complete use of observations in that region. So um, this is something that's designed to let more observations into the RTMA, and right now it is not configured to reject observations. So it only acts in a way that will let uh, more obs in. Um, we, can, we, we might change that configuration uh, you know, with, with future changes to the RTMA, but right now, that's how it's configured since the feedback we've received from the field is we, we really need the RTMA to be using as many observations as possible. Um, and so that was sort of the development approach that was, uh, that was taken with this. OK. Uh, so we'll go into a few examples. These are all examples that we've gotten from, uh, uh, from a few uh, uh, Susan Central Region. I know some of you are on the... Uh, the listserv, which I'll go over here in just a minute. This is uh, an example uh, over the front range of uh, Colorado that was sent to us in uh, uh, in December. Uh, and this is just a, a GFE uh, a screen grab that was sent to us. Uh, you can see the observations mostly in the 30s. However, in the gridded values, you see uh, values, if you look at the color bar here, well into the 20s. Uh, not really supported by the observations. Uh, so just to tell you a little bit about uh, what happened here, the, uh, the spottiness, and you can see the sort of these values in the 20s are showing up sort of randomly here where there aren't a lot of, where there aren't a lot of observations. Uh, that's occurring in the, uh, the downscaling from the RAP. Uh, the RAP, uh, uh, what happened here is the lap, the RAP uh, low-level lapse rate was applied over a very, over a very uh, large area of very of somewhat varying terrain, uh, and was applied it sort of blindly, so that we ended up with these very, very low temperatures. We also had a few observations in this case that were thrown out by the gross air check. Uh, what we've done to correct this is we've relaxed the gross air check and applied the buddy check to save these observations from being thrown out. Uh, the WFO provided reject list, that was more of a western re region issue than a central region issue, but they are gone now. And perhaps most importantly, we've changed the background that we're, we're using higher resolution models, the HER and the uh, CONUS NAM NEST, so that the downscaling effects that you see aren't as extreme, the terrain change, uh, particularly in areas uh, like this over the Rocky Mountains aren't as extreme. Uh, this is just another uh, another shot of the uh, of the analysis that we drew internally here. You can see the sort of spotty values uh, in the 20 in the 20s here along the interstate. Uh, here's the uh, new RTMA analysis with the new background and the buddy check and everything. Uh, you can see the uh, 
the, the spotty nature of the analysis you can see is gone. Uh, you can also see that uh, the analysis is quite a bit uh, quite a bit warmer. Uh, analysis values in the uh, mid to upper 30s, which closely match uh, match the observations. Uh, this is another uh, example we were sent by, I believe this was the office in Fargo, North Dakota. This is uh, an inland lake, an inland lake that I'm not even going to try to pronounce. Um, <laughs> This is uh, again a GFE shot that that was uh, that was sent to us, and you can see uh, RTMA va analysis values that are uh, rather low in the uh, in the 60s when air temperatures were in the 70s, and you can see when looking at the analysis, you see just sort of spots here. Uh, obviously, we would like to have a bit of a, a bit of a cooler temperatures uh, over the lake itself. Uh, you can see the RTMA is, is sort of drawing for the lake, kind of, but it's not really resolved that well. Uh, this is a shot from uh, an MDL uh, web viewer that uh, that I'll go over in more detail towards uh, uh, towards the end here. I think some of you are already familiar with this, but uh, in the top right is the uh, this is actually the Irma that's in place right now. You can see the the big spot over the center of the lake, and a couple other spots here on the eastern uh, eastern finger of the lake. Uh, in the bottom two panels, uh, we have an Irma with the uh, the blended background, uh, the Her and the Nam, and we also have an Irma with uh, that we ran for a while just with a, a Her based background, no influence from the Nam here. Uh, you can see in both cases the uh, uh, the green shading, the cooler temperatures, uh, much more lined up with the lake. Uh, and that's a function, again, of using the higher resolution models and the higher resolution land set. Uh, it should, we should note that there are some significant differences uh, between the, uh, uh, the Irma blend and the Irma Her. Uh, what we found from looking at this case and other cases is that we thought the Her might be overdoing the gradient here a little bit. Uh, this is one of the reasons why we're using a blended background rather than a uh, rather than a uh, than a her only background. There are a couple other uh, issues with the her as well, which are not shown here, but we can go over at the end if you want. Uh, issues with uh, with moisture, with dew point especially. Uh, just another uh, closer uh, closer looking shot. Uh, you can see uh, with the Irma blade, the Irma. Excuse me. Her only based Irma, uh, very cold temperatures extending uh, well onto the land here. You can see with the blend, the effect is not quite as extreme. Uh, those dots you see are observations are observation locations. We don't have any observations here in that that uh, uh, that tiny little pocket. We do have this one over the eastern uh, eastern finger over, over the lake where it is a bit warmer. That's partially what led us to go with the, the blended background rather than the uh, uh, rather than the her only background. And then here in the bottom right was the original uh, the original Irma. You can see not much of a gradient there at all. Uh, so again, just to just to summarize what's going on here, uh, the higher resolution models were were able to uh, well resolve the uh, the cool temperatures over the lakes. Uh, much better than the RAP, which is a coarser resolution. Uh, again, as I mentioned, the HER forecasting very cool temperatures over the lake shore. Uh, we were a little concerned about that. That's part of the reason we brought in the uh, the NAM nest. We should also note that we have seen issues with uh, water surface temperatures or sea surface temperatures uh, in the RAP uh, that have largely been resolved uh, in the HER, and then the NAM nest uses a completely different algorithm to get water surface temperatures. Uh, so that's uh, uh, that's a uh, a major improvement there. Uh, one other example, and this is to show you a little bit the uh, the washout effect. Uh, this is another example uh, over Colorado. Uh, these are uh, uh, Plots we make internally here with the we have a little uh, Google Earth uh, trick that we use, 
to uh, plot the observations over the analysis, and we color code the observations based on how they were used, uh, and we color them just like a traffic light because it makes it much easier to follow. Uh, this is uh, this is again over uh, at least southern Colorado. Uh, yeah, you can see I-25 here. Uh, uh, you can see here the uh, the background and the uh, the terrain contours and uh, all the observations here. Uh, here's the analysis. You can see it's generally a bit cool, a bit uh, cooler than the uh, than uh, what you see in the first guess. And I should mention this is the, this is the new first guess. Uh, and I'll show you. Uh, uh, this is just to show you the sort of uh, uh, the increment differences that you can see when you have a lot of observations spaced closely together. You can again, you can see the increments mostly following the lines of the terrain, but you notice that you don't have a, uh, I guess what you would call a bullseye effect uh, around each individual observation. Uh, you can see it a little bit in areas of terrain here. Where uh, where you're in a uh, I believe I believe that's a hill peak where the observations are at the same elevation so they are uh, collectively influencing the analysis in that uh, in that valley uh, and again here in the north but here where the terrain is not quite as complex you can see the uh, uh, the increments are a great deal larger uh, just just spatially and you can see all the observations here are uh, uh, collectively influencing uh, the analysis. So you won't necessarily get an analysis that fits every one of these observations. Uh, and here's a table uh, proving that to a certain extent. Uh, you could ignore this, uh, uh, the her, uh, these her columns here. They don't, uh, uh, because we're using the blended back, we ended up using the, the, we're going to use the blended background in operations. Uh, but again, you have uh, uh, this, particular site, which I believe is a, uh, uh, a METAR site, uh, quite a bit warmer than the analysis. Uh, the analysis was uh, uh, was warmed up, but not quite to the level uh, to the level of the observation. Part of the reason why that happened is there was enough, there were other other observations nearby that were a little cooler, uh, so that led to a bit of a, a, a counteract a, uh, a counteracting effect, almost. Uh, a mashed potatoes or a washing out or a washing out effect. Uh, these uh, and again, these are uh, I believe these are Colorado DOT sites mostly. Uh, the CO stations, the D and E stations are uh, are CWAP sites. I believe CCYC2 is a raw site. I could be wrong about that. Uh, but the issue we're trying to go over here is that when you have a lot of observations close together, uh, the observations can sort of counter-influence each other, and you can get these sort of washed-out increments that don't necessarily match every single observation. Uh, this can be a problem over, uh, over areas of very complex terrain like you have in the western part of your region. Uh, the other thing that's important, I guess, to point out here is um, this might be a scenario where it might be good to have a body check which could reject some of these observations. Um, you know, this is, a, this is a case where perhaps an ob is not in sync with its buddies and we might want to do, actually apply some additional quality control. That's not something we're doing right now, but it's certainly something to consider. Um, another thing just to add on to what Steve's saying, in terms of data simulation, uh, when you have observations grouped together, the impact of an individual observation will be less. Uh, if you have an observation which is isolated, uh, you know, it's kind of out by itself. Um, the impact of that individual observation on the analysis will certainly be, uh, you know, much more. Um, you know, it's, it, there, it's also a function of a, a couple other variables, but that's a generally, you know, true thing that, that you can say and you can, you can sort of expect. So this washing out effect is sort of also, you know, you can think of it as, uh, you know, you can kind of say you're kind of averaging together all the observations um, or all the, the dense observations uh, together. Uh, so it, that's just kind of one way you can think about it. So again, you know, if you have a group of observations, you know, the individual impact from one observation won't be felt, felt as strongly on the analysis as, you know, that might be uh, 
you know, it's the case if the observations, you know, if you had an isolated observation. Right, and, and this washing out effect can be, it, it won't necessarily occur if you have observations that match a background field. Say if you've got a, uh, a strong cold front coming through. Uh, and you'll see this more in areas of where the terrain isn't as complex, I guess, in more the, the eastern parts of your region over towards the, over towards, uh, the Great Lakes where terrain isn't quite uh, as, as much of an issue. Um, what I'm trying to say here is that the RGMA is not going to say, oh, the background says there's a gradient here, but the observations say there's not a gradient here. So we're going. So the RGMA is going to not draw a gradient there. It's going to simply uh, take the ob take those observations, take the increments, and apply them. So a gradient will still show up if it's present uh, in the background field. Now, if you have a background field where there isn't a strong gradient, but you have a lot of observations showing a very strong gradient, uh, that might be much more likely to show up. But you're going to need more than just one observation on each side to uh, to get an, to uh, to get an effect like that. Um, ideally, you'd probably want, I'd say, at least ten or more on each side when you're looking at. Uh, well, it, it depends on how large an area you're looking at. I mean, the, the fact of the matter is, this is why we use short-term forecasts as a background in the RTMA to mitigate these issues with you know positioning areas errors of you know with gradients associated with cold fronts and whatnot. So um, that, that, that shouldn't be too much of an issue, but the RTMA, depending on the observation density, should be able to correct for some of these positioning errors. Again, if we don't have observations there, then the, the RTMA can't, can't do any corrections if it doesn't have any new knowledge about the state of the atmosphere in that region. Right. Yeah, this is Paul Pueblo. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, um, some background on that case, if you could go back to that image, please. Uh, this one? Or the following one, it doesn't matter. I mean, okay. yeah, the next. Um, K4V1, which is sort of in the middle of the screen there, if you look to the southwest, there's a low spot in the um, mountains, and that's a notorious, notoriously breezy area with southwest winds. And that case was a day where the winds were shooting through the gap in Walsenburg mixed out, and they were well up in the upper 40s, while the other places just still had the shallow inversion. And I guess the lesson the gain from this is that the Unless it's in the background, the RTMA and URMA aren't going to be able to pick up on these subtle, um, you know, minor mesoscale differences, which caused by why would if you look at the whole, if you look at everything, the wind and the synoptic pattern would logically make sense. Is that correct? Yeah, I mean that's that's generally the case. Again, I mean it's an issue of representativeness. Uh, you know, so if it's something that can be resolved and is something that one might logically expect the NAMS, you know, four-kilometer conus nests or the HER to be able to do, um, then one might consider that that's, a, that's something that's reasonable to expect to be present in the background. Um, again, you know, we also need to have observations in the area to correct for this. I realize that K4V1 is relatively close there. It's a little bit hard for me to tell, but, um, and I'm, again, I'm not intimately familiar with the meteorology in the region. Um, but, you know, I mean, that's, that's, that's a certain kind of scenario where we would like for the RTMA to be able to handle, you know, that, that sort of case a little bit better. But, um, you know, it's, these are all very difficult problems to handle, uh, you know, from, from a data simulation uh, side. So, um, I don't know, Steve, do you have anything to add? Yeah, uh, Paul, you, you had mentioned the strong southwesterly winds uh, in that area, and I should mention that unlike in, say, a model forecast, uh, each variable for RTMA or URMA is analyzed individually. Uh, it's not, the RGMA is not going to look at the temperature and then look at the wind and say, and you know, see there's a, a southwesterly breeze there to warm up temperatures, as, as, as you mentioned. Each variable is uh, analyzed individually. Uh, that is one weakness of the RTMA and, and one that will show up particularly in these areas of, uh, of complex terrain. And I know, I know you've, uh, I, I know we've talked, we've talked a lot over the past few months and you've sent us a lot of, uh, a lot of great examples, but this, uh, you know, this is an automated product. Uh, it is not necessarily going to draw to every single 
small-scale feature that you could find, uh, particularly in an air, in a in a forecast area uh, like you had, where everything is is so driven by uh, by the terrain. Well, one thing that's worth adding there, and Steve made a great point about uh, you know there's sort of not a lot of well there, there's no cross variable correlation uh, that's handled in the data simulation scheme that we use in our TMA. For those of you who are familiar uh, with some of the data simulation jargon, we use it's called a, a two-dimensional variational data simulation approach. Um, there are more advanced data simulation techniques which actually can handle uh, cross-variable correlations where we can say whenever we draw an analysis increment where we want, uh, you know, we can, we can produce uh, changes in the field, uh, you know, in, in, in unobserved variables. For example, if we have a temperature observation, we might be able to inform a, ourselves a little bit about how that might uh, affect the wind field and so on and so forth. Running such a data simulation scheme is, is pretty expensive, um, and right now we actually do use that sort of approach in the uh, GFS, uh, um, but extending that down to the scale at which we could do that for the RTMA would require running a pretty a, a fairly reasonably sized suite of convection allowing ensembles, you know, at say three or four kilometer grid spacing, which is pretty expensive to do. So, um, so right now, you know, I, I think your expectations are, 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 are you know, what you stated uh, previously is, is pretty reasonable um, and just, you know, kind of one of those things to keep an eye on. But rest assured, there are data simulation techniques which can, you know, help, help with this kind of uh, scenario and something, you know, which might change in, as we, uh, move down the road and we've got computing increases coming and whatnot, so, you know, hopefully it's something we can address in the years to come. Yeah, uh, we should also mention that I I think you've seen these too, Jacob. There are proposals out there uh, to generate a three-dimensional uh, yeah. analysis of record. Yep. Um, that's something hopefully we'll be able to do with the new, with all the new computing power that's coming online. Yeah, but that, those are all kind of plans and nothing's really concrete on paper yet, so we'll stick to the 2D RTMA discussion for now, I guess, and yeah. kind of go on to the next slide here. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, the sky cover analysis. Jacob, you did most of the work on this. So yeah, so the sky cover analysis was born out of um, some feedback we gotten from, from Central Region, actually. Uh, I guess the new, the current sky cover field that's produced or sort of, of I guess, kind of uh, distributed along with RTMA right now um, is a, a remapped uh, NetDisk product, I believe, of Ghost Sounder or Effective Cloud Amount uh, field. Anyway, the complaint has generally been that the sky cover that's, that's sent out isn't, isn't, isn't uh, really, you know, solving the problems that need to be solved or addressing the issues that need to be addressed, and it's, it's not working well. Um, so after some discussions with some folks in Central Region, we um, decided to have a little collaboration with Jordan Gerth from the University of Wisconsin Sims. Um, he had, as a part of his PhD dissertation, a, a pretty nice cloud analysis product and you know a, a nice sky cover analysis. And so he came out to visit us at EMC. And uh, from that visit, we've been able to establish actually a, a data feed of a GOES imager sky cover data uh, that's produced via some uh, new uh, GOESR funded uh, algorithms. And so we've been receiving this data in, and it, it's, uh, we've been actually per ingesting it into, the, into, uh, into our, our uh, data stream, as well as into our data simulation software, which is what we, in, in, and subsequently our TMA and our IRMA. So um, I just kind of want to highlight this, since this is now a, a new analysis variable that's a part of the RTMA. And I'll just show, you know, just a quick example. Um, you know, on the upper left here is the RTMA background field of, of sky cover. In the middle here is just an example plot of some GOES imager observations. Just note, I know that, you know, only part of the CONUS is covered here. We do have full CONUS coverage. We're getting observations from GOES 13 and 15. Uh, on the far right here are just the surface-based observations. So before, prior to having these GOES imager observations, you know, we were really reliant on these surface OBS. And as a part of this upgrade, it was nice to be able to get the uh, GOES imager data uh, as well. So on the bottom left is just the analysis with only with surface observations. So you can see it's kind of spotty and sparse and the coverage isn't, you know, maybe uh, quite what, what we might expect or, or want. And on the right is the analysis with the new GOES imager observations and surface OBS. So, um, you know, it, it's got cover data, you know, it's, but we're better matching the imager data, uh, we, you know, in, in, this, in this case. And, you know, we're hopeful and optimistic that, um, 
this new sky cover analysis variable will be much more useful. Um, if there are issues with it, you know, this is, you know, this is the first time we've added this analysis variable to your RTMA, please certainly let us know and we'll try to get that addressed for the next uh, upgrade. So this is something that will be coming in with the, with the upcoming RTMA bundle. Okay. Uh, we have another upgrade coming up in about six months or so, so I'll briefly go over what we want to do with that. Uh, new variables, min and max temperature, uh, which will be, uh, that will only be part of uh, IRMA, that won't be in RTMA. Uh, ceiling and significant wave height should be in both. Uh, we're looking at uh, uh, slight changes to the way we're doing the wind and dew point analysis that should hopefully improve the analysis with those variables. Uh, we may change the quality control a little bit to give different weights to different observations based on their background match and other factors. Right now, observation error is pretty much purely a function of observation type, and we're looking at possibly changing that up a bit. Uh, we're also going to expand the uh, the domain westward, but that's not terribly relevant for central region. Uh, I see we're running out of time here, so I'll go through this as quickly as I can. Uh, feedback. We have, uh, we have a lot of ways where you can look at the RTMA uh, that don't necessarily take up a lot of your band, a lot of bandwidth. I know bandwidth is a, is a big issue for many of you with the WFOs. We've created some of our own websites uh, here. Example, just to click on this, this is a, these are some quick Python generated graphics of, uh, of uh, URMA and you can zoom into a certain area. Uh, yeah, probably zoom into an area closer to you all. Here's the Great Lakes. Yeah. Uh, Sky cover is on there as well. Right, right. At least the Irma parallels. Yeah, uh, you can compare. I can go back to the slide here. Uh, there's a, you can compare uh, what we have in parallel now, our development version, with what's currently in operations. Our friends at MDL involved with the National Model Blend Project made a website. Uh, this is a four-panel uh, plot that I showed earlier that allows you to compare the RTMA and URMA, both the parallel and what's in operations, and also a couple different analysis schemes. Uh, LAPS, I think, is on there. Uh, there may be a couple others. Uh, as far as collecting your feedback, we have uh, monthly conference calls, which we have a Google Calendar entry if you're interested in joining that. Uh, mostly we use a listserv to, uh, to collect feedback. You can see the email there. Um, if you have an issue, if you have a question about something you see in the RTMA, it's best if you submit it through this, uh, this listserv address. That, that way all the developers will be on it. Uh, our supervisors are on it. Uh, several people from Central Region are on it. I know some of you are on it. Uh, it's just easier because it lands in everybody's email box everybody's email inbox. And if it's an issue that's being shown in other areas, hopefully we can we can explain an issue once and then it hopefully it'll apply in other areas as well. Uh, whenever you send us uh, feedback, we do ask that you give us a, the cycle time date, a screenshot, and tell us where we're looking at. We don't have uh, county maps committed committed to memory, but anything you can provide, county names, station IDs, uh, cities nearby, roads, a lat lawn box, something that we can, uh, just something so that we can identify the area and know uh, what we're looking at and what the RTMA should be drawing for but isn't necessarily drawing for. Uh, again, another uh, another uh, slide explaining uh, the, the MDL viewer. Uh, we should explain that the official uh, evaluation period for uh, RTMA and URMA will be starting shortly. Uh, so you can see the data on the MDL viewer now. And we're going to put it on an FTP server so you can grab it yourselves if you want. Uh, we've run a couple uh, experimental parallels before those are going to be turned off. That was a, a background field decision that's already been made. Uh, the upgrade, uh, actually going into operations, that's scheduled for mid to late March. Uh, after the 30-day evaluation period. Uh, we should mention that we're already starting work for, uh, for the next upgrade, and as soon as we have a working parallel, uh, you know, improvements either with, uh, with the analysis improvements for dew point or winds or with the new variables, 
Uh, we will put a message out on this listserv and put those analysis files onto uh, an FTP server here at EMC so that anyone who wants to can uh, look at the uh, look at the new fields themselves. themselves. Uh, you can contact us about them. Uh, we want you to be part of the, uh, we want the evaluation process to be ongoing. I guess it's the message that, uh, that I'm trying to get at here. You can look at things yourself, compare them to what's currently in operations, let us know if you like something you're seeing, if you don't like something you're seeing, if you have a question about some, how something is working, uh, please use the listserv, uh, get a hold of us. We try to get back to you uh, as soon as we can. Uh, I think we've been consistently uh, getting back to people within uh, within at least uh, a couple days. Uh, again, another shot of the uh, of the viewer. Uh, that's all I have for uh, for slides. Uh, so I guess at this point, if we uh, Manuel just walked in the room here now, so if you all uh, have any questions, we can uh, we can take those now. Thank you. Are the significant wave height grids going to be included for the Great Lakes? Uh, yes. Yeah. yeah, they'll be included for Great Lakes as well. Great. Thank you. Yeah, we're we're all we're also I, I, I didn't mention uh I should also mention that we're also looking at uh uh there's an analysis product that comes out of the Great Lake, the Gloral the Gloral Lab. Uh and uh we've been told by uh, our wave modeling folks here that that's a good analysis used to drive the wave model. So we're going to try to implement something over the Great over the Great Lakes to make it mimic that analysis basically, especially with uh, with winds. Any more questions or comments? Yeah, this is uh, Matt Foster at Central Region SSD. Um, one thing that's um, been discussed before, and I'm going to bring it up again just because I, I want to bring it up again, is the the whole blacklist thing. Are are there? I know there are, shall I say, reservations about rapidly updating blacklists. Are are there any discussions going on about how uh, blacklisting of problem stations could be more dynamic, or is the idea that the more sophisticated uh, QCing of OBS can just usurp blacklisting of a problem station? The hope is that the more sophisticated QC can at least somewhat usurp the blacklisting. Uh, as far as dynamic blacklisting goes, we, we've tried that. We tried it especially with Western Region, and it was a disaster. Uh, we, we had observations that went on suddenly and never came off. Um, it, there's also a, a bit of a security issue in, in what can go into uh, and what can go into the central computer. Um, that being said, if you know there's an observation that's consistently bad, even for one particular particular variable, and you don't want it going into the RTMA, uh, that's something we can change fairly easily, uh, particularly in our parallel and in operations too. We have to submit an RFC, so there is a process there. Um, but we can do that. We have some. Uh, dynamic blacklisting going on already uh, with winds, especially. Uh, we have a, an algorithm to to try to find stations that are partially obstructed by buildings or trees or whatever. Uh, we also have uh, diurnal uh, blacklists for for temperature and moisture. Uh, the idea behind and the, the, these these temperature and moisture blacklists are are quite small. Um, the idea is we're trying to find stations that maybe are are poorly exposed or are overexposed, but are only but are only like that at certain parts of the day, either when the sun is up or when the sun is down. Uh, we also have a straight blacklist that we get from uh, MADIS to find observations that are obviously unrepresentative uh, and they're consistently unrepresentative. Um, the hope is that the variational QC will hopefully take care of the uh, the more uh, dynamic 
uh, blacklisting that you mentioned. Uh, does that does that answer your question? Yeah, that uh, that does answer my question. It, it's a, it's a concern that the central region has had for for some time. So we'll you know we'll just kind of continue to monitor. I w I would like to think that you know at least I, I understand the the security concerns that are mentioned and whatnot. Uh, uh, that um, you know there should be some kind of secure way that we could that we could do you know some sort of more dynamic because sometimes the responsiveness of you know requesting that a site be blacklisted can be a little slow for a WFO's purposes um oh, yeah. you know, we'll just, we'll just, we'll watch how the the variational QC performs and and hopefully like you said that that will take care of of the vast majority of the issues yeah, and, and we should mention that the variational QC is not going in in this upgrade, but should be going in for the following one. Right. Um, when is, so, when is mean, that? Go ahead. Uh, I probably, what, Manuel, do you think maybe end of this fiscal year? Yeah. Or the end of the fiscal year? Yeah, yeah, so I would say September, October time frame. Okay, that 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 sounds good. We'll we'll just continue to watch it. Thank okay, you. thank you. And, Any additional questions? And if you do have questions, which we don't, maybe don't have time to get to here, you can always shoot us an email on the uh, uh, the uh, analysis of record our TMA was served to. So there's always that uh, venue as well. Okay. Well, Steve and uh, and Jacob, thank you very much. And Manuel, I guess you got in there at the end. <laughs> Okay, well, thanks, everyone, and uh, take care, and we'll have the recording uh, available to you shortly.